Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about the lung function, focusing on the four important lung volumes and then talk about the lung capacities. Um, and following this video, there's a follow up on spirometry and how it relates to these values. So we begin by looking at the anatomy of the lungs. Here is a person's respiratory system, the upper and lower respiratory tract. Here are the ribs, which wrap around the lungs and help protect it. The muscular diaphragm, which plays a main role in helping uh, with respiration, as well as the intercostal muscles. The lungs allow us to take in or inspire oxygen and remove or exhale carbon dioxide. This is an exchange. The exchange of gases occur in the building blocks, you can say, of the lungs, called the alveolus. An important calculation of lung function can be gleaned from the displacement of air volume during inspiration and or expiration. I'm going to represent the four important lung volumes using the alveoli as an example. This is just a concept to hopefully understand the differences in lung volumes. We're going to talk about the lung volume of a typical adult male. Adult females have slightly lower values than the ones I'll be talking about. But here, the concept is the main thing, so I hope it makes sense. The amount of air we breathe in and out in our lungs normally can be referred to as the tidal volume. Typical values of the tidal volume are on the order of 500 to 750 mils. However, we can also take a deep breath in, deep inspiration. Thus, our volume of air in our lungs can increase. This is the inspiratory reserve volume, the air inspired with a maximal inspiratory effort in excess of the tidal volume. Typically, the inspiratory reserve volume is about three liters. So again, we're looking at the four important lung volumes. Here again is an example of your tidal volume, and this is your inspiratory reserve volume. We can also exhale more than usual. The amount of air we can exhale in addition to the tidal volume is the expiratory reserve volume. This is typically 1.5 liters. Thus, at the end of the day, there's always an amount of air or volume remaining in our lungs after a maximal expiratory effort. This is the residual volume and is about one liter. When all four of the above uh, volume components are taken together, they make up the total lung capacity, about uh, six liters. And we will talk more about this later. There is this also thing called dead space. This is basically the part of the respiratory tract or part of the lungs that does not participate in gas exchange. Now let's learn more about those four volumes by representing it in a graph, because these volumes have important implications in health and disease. So here is a graph on the y-axis is the lung volume in mil. Remember, our total lung volume is about 6 liters, so 6,000 mils, in adult males. So let's draw it out. Going up here is when we inspire, so inspiration, and increase our lung volume, obviously. And going down the y-axis is when we exhale air. So we are decreasing our lung volume, which kind of makes sense. The x-axis is just time, nothing really specific. So let's now first recap our four important lung volumes. If you remember, the amount of air that moves into the lungs with each inspiration during quiet breathing is their tidal volume, typically 500 mils, 0.5 liters just like so. Remember the dead space. We're not talking about this area because it has no uh, role in gas exchange. Let's just say we are breathing normally and then suddenly take the biggest breath in. This is the inspiratory reserve volume and can get up to three liters in addition to the tidal volume. Don't worry, here I drew 1,200, but it's meant to be uh, 3 liters. It will correct itself soon. Then let's say we breathe normally, 
so normal tidal volume, and then we have a maximal expiratory phase. This is the expiratory reserve volume, typically 1.5 liters. And the air left in the lungs after a maximal expiratory effort is the residual volume, which is about one liter. So an adult male will typically have a total lung capacity of six liters, a female 4.5 liters. Now, different textbooks have different values. Now, just like we talked about those four lung volumes, there are four lung capacities. I already introduced the total lung capacity, which is one of them. Now, let's recap the same graph containing the lung volumes again, and also introduce the lung capacities. So the amount of air that moves into the lungs with each inspiration during quiet, normal breathing is called the tidal volume, about 500 mils or 0.5 liters. The air inspired with a maximal inspiratory effort in excess of the tidal volume is the inspiratory reserve volume, which is typically three liters. The volume expelled by an active expiratory effort after passive expiration is the expiratory reserve volume, which is about one liter. And of course, you have the air left in the lungs after a maximal expiratory effort, which is the residual volume, about one liter as well. The vital lung capacity refers to the maximum amount of air expired from a fully inflated lung, which means that it's essentially the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. These three components will give you the vital lung capacity. The maximum amount of air inspired from the end expiratory level is the inspiratory capacity, which is about 3.5 liters. So it's essentially the inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume. The functional residual capacity uh, which should not be mixed up with the residual volume, represents the volume of air remaining in the lungs after expiration of a normal breath. So this is essentially the, the residual volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. And the amount is typically 2.5 liters. Finally, the fourth lung capacity that we have already talked about is the sum of all the lung volumes essentially. And this is the total lung capacity. Again, in the males, the total lung capacity is about six liters and in females, about 4.2 liters, but different textbooks say different things. Now that we have a better understanding of the lung volumes and lung capacities, let us see how this can be used to diagnose and monitor certain lung conditions. What I mean specifically is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and also restrictive lung diseases.